Are you worried about crime in your neighborhood? A lot of you are. We hear from you every day. Tonight, my partner Larry Connors begins a special report on the wars being waged on the streets. Thank you, Julius. Odds are most of you watching live in a neighborhood where your children can safely play outside. But if you live anywhere here in Illinois, over into Missouri, at any place, even some of the exclusive areas of St. Louis County, you need to know about a battle underway on North St. Louis streets, because if the battle is lost at that location, it's only a matter of time before it's going to reach into your streets. Now, tonight we're going into this region, Walnut Park. Now, let me emphasize, it is a misconception to think that crime only exists in North St. Louis, and it is wrong to think that all of North St. Louis is bad. Walnut Park is not necessarily any worse than anywhere else in North St. Louis. But here, you just can't talk about fighting crime. You have to get into the streets and do something about it. And some Walnut Park citizens are willing to openly protest against drug dealers despite the danger. You got to go! You got to go! You got to go! It might be hard for you to really imagine just how much crime can be concentrated in one area. This is the Walnut Park neighborhood. Two blocks that way, two blocks that way, five blocks over here and five blocks over here. We're right in the center. And just in this one region, last year, 11 murders, 13 rapes, 250 assaults, and most of those involving pistols, just right here. to find ways to cut out that cancerous part. The neighborhood may be known for its crime, but it's also known for the kind of people that are here now who really do care about the neighborhood. Let's face it, we have to arrest people. They violate the law, we must arrest them. That's our duty and that's what we're paid to do. In Walnut Park, as in other St. Louis trouble spots, community organizations hold regular meetings with police. Now, this is an opportunity for police to build and repair relationships, to report on how the fight against crime is going. We managed to stop a car recently on Lillian at uh, Davison and recover uh, approximately five ounces of cocaine. This is a time to enlist more eyes and ears in the fight. You saw him running down the street with a gun in his hand. That's all I need. You don't have to uh, testify in any court, because if I find him with a gun, that's on him, between him and me and the court. You don't even need to get involved in that. But we need to find out what you folks are seeing. It is a time to listen to complaints to ease some constant fears. The shooting, that the shooting, the drive-by on Mimica is, has spilled over. Oh, my. I know it's spilled over. I don't ever see anything. I just hear shooting. But if you bring it to our attention, we will try to patrol the area a little bit more. Well, I heard the shooting, and I'll call the police, and he asked me, did I see any one, as if I'm going to stick my head out the door and try to see someone that's shooting out there. Eventually, you will see things happen. Uh, like I said before, I can't guarantee an overnight success because my partner and I have the entire Walnut Park area. Hey, stop the crack. We want our neighborhoods back. Stop the crack. We want our neighborhoods back. There's a lot of decent people here, and we work very hard and conscientious in trying to keep our homes up and everything, and we just bombarded by the few bad apples in the barrel. Yeah, take her. We got two females. We'll okay. transport her. You got the other one? Yeah, we got it. That story sets the stage for some of those stories you're going to see over the next two nights. Tomorrow night, we remember a seven-year-old boy who used to play on those same streets. And a close look at some police tactics which you might not see, might not even tolerate in your neighborhood.
Tonight we're going to show you some police tactics used in some of the hottest trouble spots in St. Louis. Larry Connors continues his special report. Larry? Thank you, Julius. How would you react if police arbitrarily stop you or your children in your neighborhood, maybe stopping you just to see some identification, perhaps ask what you're doing? Now, that happens routinely in some areas, and the residents don't really mind. You might not accept these tactics in your neighborhood, but you probably don't live in the midst of crack houses and drive-by shootings. You make us a little bit nervous, all right? You might be disturbed by some of the police tactics used in St. Louis troubled spots. Didn't you just come out there? You want you to lose that? No. You want to lose that? No. You want to do that again? Sorry, man. This does not mean constitutional rights are being violated, but it does mean on the front line, in the trenches, cops can't give an inch. Ah! Nothing on these streets is routine. Hey, dude, you got a driver's license? Hey, well, don't tell me what you're trying to do. I, I can see what you're trying to do. You got this on your chest. Mm -hmm. You got that pistol on your hip. All of this makes you a target. Oh, well, Automatic visible target. We're, we're fully aware of that. That's why our training takes over. And everybody's got a gun. Everybody's willing to use it. And some of them won't think twice about using it. I, I just can't sit around and let that stop me from doing what I have to do. Officers Rob Fowler and Reggie Williams are assigned to the cops program. Their job, know everyone in the neighborhood. Those who live here are simply passed through. Where's it at? I don't know. Oh, you don't know? Oh, you're gonna play dumb white boy, huh? That works real good around here. You know what happened the last one that tried to do that? He went to jail. This is Walnut Park, pal. This ain't Lulu. I still come back to Rob the fact that when you go home, uh, you guys sometimes you gotta just feel like, uh, I don't know what I did tonight. Well, I get to share my feelings with my wife, and I get to unload a little bit on her, and uh, I never go right to sleep. It's always an unwinding period. And uh, you just, you can't let it bother you. It's, uh, like I said, every day is a new day. You gotta feel good, too, then, if you see a kid that you turned around, that you found on the street, you turned him, and uh, you got him back on the path. Well, that's, 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 uh, that's part of the, uh, the job when you look back and you, and you get that little smile to yourself, and you say, you know, I remember when that kid was out there flipping dope. Or Officer Williams has three boys, five, eight, and 10. And when he sees kids dying on these streets, it's almost like losing one of his own. I lost a kid that I had been working very closely with uh, for over over two or three years. Uh, I had a I had a real serious problem with dealing with that, but you know it's it's just part of it. You just have to get over it, and it hurts. But like I said, you just go out there and see if you can save the next guy. The families that live in this neighborhood are no different than yours. Parents who care about their kids, just like you, they have a dream for their kids. They want something better for them. But for them, their first goal is to get their kids off these streets alive. When he got shot, he ran in there and fell. Oh. And uh, they say he was dead before they took him away from here. I don't know. And the only thing that could have been on his mind was he was eight years old. He was only seven. Emma Harrington is talking about her grandson. October 1991, Aaron was playing inside his house. The next moment, there was a drive-by shooting, and Aaron was dead. It was that quick. When talking about Aaron, Emma's face is filled with a sadness you can almost feel. At 45, she's raised eight children, and daily she cares for her 10-year-old and a dozen grandkids. She's not philosophical about raising kids on these streets. For her, it's simply day-to-day -day survival. But despite her best efforts and constant prayers, she knows she wasn't able to save Aaron. He was only seven. And I thought I had him protected, you know, by making sure he came in the house. I don't want to leave you thinking that there is no hope in these neighborhoods. There is hope, so don't miss that part of the story tomorrow night. And while we were on the streets early one morning, we had what appeared to be some gang members, Bloods, drive up on us.
That was interesting. That's also tomorrow night. At night, you kiss your kids good night, you put them in bed, but in some neighborhoods, parents kiss their kids good night and they put them on the floor to give them more protection in case there's a drive-by shooting. As one young woman said, in gunfire is sometimes the lullaby of the night. For many of these children, there is no age of innocence. They are living in the middle of street wars. Many of these kids have seen blood on the asphalt. You don't have to be a psychiatrist to know how these young minds can be affected. A 16-year-old boy was shot in the back of his head about three blocks from here, and I noticed that there were a number of children standing around at that time who looked at the remains of this person, and they seemed to be unshaken. There was no emotion on their faces. Khatib Wahid is program director for a community project based out of the Walbridge School in St. Louis. Night and day, he works to save children, coordinating anti-drug marches, providing programs for children. Bring your knee up first. He knows if good does not fill these young minds, evil will. While your children go to sleep with sweet dreams, many of these kids go to sleep with visions of bodies on the streets of their neighborhoods. It begins to make you wonder are children becoming conditioned to accept this kind of lifestyle? And if so, what does that say about our hopes for the future of a peaceful world if our future leaders are experiencing violence on a daily basis and learning to accept it? While cruising some of the streets, we came across a group that started to scatter when we approached. But after they saw who we were, they came back to talk. We're trying to build this back up. You know right. Well, yeah, now, that's key. You're going to build it up. You're not build gonna it up. Build it up. You know, it's, 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 there's a lot of young kids around here. How much more can we turn down? We're sitting us. in front of a vacant They're house. They're looking up to us. I want to yeah. have something to give to myself first. I want to get something for my first, then be able to get something back. Yeah. That night, we also had a group dressed in red approach us. That's the color of a gang known as the Bloods. Here, now, you guys were the gang, so you just want to be. When, when, you know, we used, we to, just, be we used to be in the gang. Around. Now we just, you know, everybody trying to, like, better themselves. Well, now, you know, you're driving around looking like this, you know. If somebody sees that you're... Looks like you're trying to, like, like like you're trying to cause trouble, though, huh? Uh, no, we just dress. dress like this. Now, you got to tell me, all honesty, what do you need a beeper for? Oh my your girl, your yeah. girls, your beeper. girls got to call you on these beepers. Yeah, so you get home. You know. And I, you're telling me the truth on that now. Yeah. Yeah. Beepers are only for girlfriends yeah. to call. Yeah. Nobody else and to call, I, set yeah, up I a deal. That, huh? That's a lot. Huh? <laughs> Be, the beepers for something yeah. else now, isn't it? Yeah, they use well, it for it. something else too. You know what it's for? <laughs> that same night, I also met two sisters and their 12-year-old friend. Their parents won't let them roam the streets at night. We try to stay out of these games. And, you know, if we stay at church, and then we talk to our friends to make them want to come to church also. And the more we put in church, the less violence we have on the streets. A lot of kids your age don't see half of what you see, you know. Mm -hmm. You're growing up pretty fast. Very. <laughs> well, our generation got to be the one to make the difference, though. Yeah. It's no matter what they go through, we still got to be the one to make that difference. You really believe that, don't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you believe you can make a difference? Yeah. yeah. You know, tonight, maybe your neighborhood and children are safe, but in this village, we are all at risk. As that last young lady suggested, maybe the best weapon for neighborhoods under siege is hope. Well, that's certainly where it has to start. I think so. All right. Thank you, Larry, for bringing us up close and personal with uh, the neighborhoods under siege.